In today's episode, we speak with Jeremy Porter, CEO of Atlanta Motor Sports Park. What do you do when you find an entire town against you and doesn't want a racetrack in their backyard? Also, Monday, you owe a half a million dollars. It's Friday, and you only have 2500 Sit back, fasten your seatbelt, and enjoy this episode. Welcome to this edition of Peak, Peak Performers, Performers Podcast. Podcast with your host, Thor Conklin. Thor will be sharing the necessary tools, strategies, and psychology you'll need to, to become, become a peak, peak performer, performer in any area, area of, of your, your life, life or business. Thor Conklin here. We give you the tricks, the tips, the tools, the strategies, the technology, and the psychology peak performers use in order to get more done and execute better than 99% of the population. If you know what to do but struggle with getting everything done, or simply want to raise your game and get more done, this podcast is for you. Welcome back. We're here today with Jeremy Porter. He's the CEO of Atlanta Motor Sports Park, AMP, a business pioneer with a loathing for the word no. The track features the most exciting elevation changes in the world. It was voted one of the top 10 racetracks in North America by Road and Track Magazine. Formerly a partner of WMI, recognized by Inc. Magazine as one of the fastest growing companies in America. Jeremy's hobbies include racing, physical fitness, snowboarding, supercross, and devotion at his church. The kart track has the most radical elevation changes of any kart track in the world. Well, Jeremy, did I forget anything? No, not really. Um, you pretty much covered everything in a, in a good thumbnail. Well, you know, I had the pleasure of uh, meeting Jeremy probably about seven years ago at an organization here in town that uh, was a group of businessmen and entrepreneurs, and it was so great to, to meet him. He had such a passion, and at that time, the track wasn't open. And it was interesting because we formed this friendship, and I don't know if it was like Fridays or Tuesdays, we talked once a week, and we had a little mastermind of how to break through all the barriers and all the opposition that uh, was in the way of getting this track and this uh, sports park completed. And I just loved the journey that you were on, and I just loved the tenaciousness that you had. Bring us back to that moment you know, in time where you were just kind of forming the ideas and, and the hurdles that you had overcome. Yeah, you know, it uh, the beginning, to be really frank with you, I had um, thought up this idea, had written a business plan for Road Atlanta back in 2000, and it actually never went anywhere. And so I picked it back up in 2007, thought, I'm going to dust this business plan off and get some of my friends to pull it together, and uh, maybe I'll be a small equity partner in the deal and uh, ran with the business plan and then everybody basically vanished because back in 2007 and eight, nine, uh, the world kind of fell apart. So my plan was simply to write the business plan and go, here you guys go, execute it. And that didn't happen because again, everybody uh, kind of disappeared into the, the uh, woods, so to speak, and said, hey, we're not in, we're not doing this, nobody's doing any development. So. A lot of uh, challenges, uh, a lot of life lessons learned, and a lot of facing the fear, for lack of a better phrase. Yeah, I mean, I remember you talking about, you know, the opposition that you had with the landowners around uh, the area and the requirements you had to jump through for the local governments. I mean, it just seemed like there was just one hurdle after another. Yeah, it, it, it was pretty crazy. You know, we... Uh, I'd never been to a zoning hearing in my life, and we showed up, and there was 600 people there. There was picketers, Channel 2, Channel 5, Channel 11, a lot of the talk radio shows you hear uh, on the various radio stations, and I had no idea what to do. I mean, it was it was amazing, and, and basically there was a lot of uh, conjured up opposition and false information that was propagated out there by a lot of the locals. And that sense has really turned. I mean, we've only received about a dozen complaints since we've been open in four years, which is pretty unheard of in our world. And uh, so now the locals are, are really for us. Oh, that's uh, that's awesome. And you got to understand, too, this is in the North Georgia mountains. This is not in the middle of Atlanta. So 600 people showing up at uh, at those meetings is incredible. Yeah, it was quite it was quite an attended meeting, for lack of a better uh, phrase. You know, they had on red shirts and little signs they hold stop amp and it was pretty entertaining 
Wow. You know, and I also remember from our calls as well, you were in the early stages of the development and you were putting down some of the, uh, you know, the initial work, you're doing the elevation changes. I remember having some of those calls and saying, hey, it's Friday, Monday morning, I owe somebody, I'll make up the figure, a half a million dollars and we got 20,000 in the bank. I've got to come up with some, you know, some ideas here. Yeah, you know, it was it was a, a faith building experience in the sense that we never missed a bill. What is so astonishing out of all those years of development and under construction, we always paid our bills, we always paid them on time. And there was one time that we had a half million dollar uh, loan payment due on the land and I literally had $2,500 in the bank. And I thought, what in the world am I gonna do? And it ended up the president of the bank uh, was a friend of the landowner and became a friend of mine. And we ended up taking the land out through some bank financing. And then we, we were receiving additional infusions of equity and membership sales and things like that to be able to continue to cash flow the business. But it all came together and we were able to put pay a tremendous amount of debt off during that period of time because literally the second we, we received a check, it would go to the next bill. So in... Most businesses, you have uh, conventional funding and you don't pay the debt off. You you cash flow the business and, and work from that point. In this case, we had to literally pay cash for everything. And we did that for a majority of the business in the beginning. Yeah, I remember talking about putting up the barriers and, and you needed, I don't know how many thousands of tires to put up. It's like, what are we going to do now? What kind of sponsors can we get? I think you had like sponsors for like sidewalks and trees and tires. It seemed like everybody was kind of, you were pulling out all the stops to figure out how to make this thing work. I've either heard a phrase or I don't know where I come up with the phrase. It was creativity over capital. And basically we didn't have cash. So we had to think of creative ways to be able to get things done. And what I did is I did a lot of bartering and advertising and sponsorship swaps. So I said, Hey, give us a guard shack and we'll give you a sign on pit road and exposure on the website. Another one was the flag stations. We have, I think it's eight flag stations around the track. We traded that for sponsorship. We traded the front entrance sign for sponsorship. We It was somewhere in the neighborhood of about $2.3 million that we'd done that with for signage around the racetrack. And that allowed us to continue to you know, build and develop the track and not have to write checks for things like that. So it looks good on our books. The bank liked it, and it was the only way that we could get it done because of the constraints of cash and the economy. We were the only track, as I understand, under construction for two years in the world. I knew that we were the only large project in the state of Georgia per the EPD because they liked to visit me often because there was nothing else to visit <laughs> for almost two years as well. So we became buds. You know, not in the greatest way, but we, we were cordial friends because they were out here often. And finally, I asked him one day, I said, why are you guys out here so often? I thought you visited projects once a year, every few years or every few months. And they said, there's nothing else under construction. Wow. I said, well, wow. that sucks. <laughs> Well, it, it's it's an amazing, uh, amazing facility. I had the chance to go out there uh, a couple months ago. You'll see on my Facebook page where I got a chance to drive the uh, Ferrari 458 and the uh, Nissan GTR. And I'm just grinning ear to ear. And what I loved about that experience was I had a professional driver next to me. And I went back and I looked at the, uh, the tape and he's just going, go for it, go for it, higher, higher, faster, faster. Just give it gas, gas, gas. And I'm sitting there behind the wheel of this very expensive automobile going, and I don't know if I can do this, but he's like, you got this, you got this, just go, 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 go. And it reminds me. We, we have a nickname for that guy in the right seat. We like to call that the victim seat. <laughs> well, you know, what was great is he had more faith in my abilities than I did at that time. And I think that's such an important metaphor for coaching is you've got to surround yourself with people that know you have more ability than you may think in the moment, you know, your board of advisors, you got Brian Moss, who's the president or ex-president of uh, Gulfstream, Ken Hussey, the CEO of Spectrum Brands, a $3 billion company. You surround yourself with incredible people. And that's so important. 
Yeah, it, it's tough. You remember our conversations. I would say this feels insurmountable or, or this, that, and the other. And I had another coach that I worked with as well. And, and we started looking at things in, in little bites. You know, what do we need to raise today? What do we need to achieve today? Where do we need to go by tomorrow? And we were looking in day increments, week increments, uh, and then month increments, really not quarterly under the construction. Because if I looked at it from a greater than a few weeks out or a month, out or 60, 90 days, the numbers were so astonishing that it just didn't feel like we would be able to get there. To put some more financial factual data behind it, we were raising and paying off $283,000 a month on average for about 14 months. And most of that was done through membership sales and probably 25% of it was done through equity in the business or sale and equity in the business. So in looking at these these people that I work with, these CEOs, these chairmen of all these other companies, they'd been through it and they knew what cash flow was about. They knew what challenges were about. And they were good about coaching of, hey, you've got this, you can do it just like that driver or that coach when you were driving the four or five eight you know really believed in you more than you believed in yourself and knew the capabilities of the car and you in that car so it was really an awesome experience what you accomplished is truly amazing my hat goes off out to you off to you you did a really good job well thank you and we you know we had a great i mean we really did i, I feel pretty honored with the team that we had and uh, a lot of people put in a lot of hard work and a lot of sweat equity and uh, made it happen it was pretty interesting for everything to come together as it has now not only are you the ceo of amp but also you used to be a professional driver is that correct well uh i wouldn't call me a professional but i used to race i've raced a little bit of everything from four to two wheels and just really enjoyed it more as an as an amateur than uh, a professional and and just loved it and that's where my passion came from this was we'd be at the racetrack and we'd be sitting in the pits you know we'd talk about how fast we are were or going to be and we would crack on each other and say, what happened over there? Did your high heel get stuck in the brake pedal or did your skirt blow in your face or, or you know, all <laughs> sorts of stuff that we'd talk about. And I'm going to offend somebody here, but it's racer talk. But, you know, it was just so much fun hanging out with people that loved to race. And the, the funny thing is, is we, we talked about racing, but we really just kind of hung out more than anything. And what we built uh, with Atlanta Motorsports Park or what we evolved into is more of that social club on oh by the way we have a, a circuit in the back and we have a go-kart track in the back and we have a conference center and all these other things but it really is a social club for people that are car enthusiasts not racers 75 percent of our 478 members have never been on a track it's almost 300 of our members never had been on a track it's your neighbor that owns a sports car so it's really a place to blow off steam and hang out with like-minded people in a similar demographic and, you know, again, talk about how fast you are, were, or going to be. <laughs> Think of it as a country club instead of a golf course. They have a racetrack. And, uh, a, yeah. you know, I, I own a uh, 600 horsepower uh, V12 Mercedes. And when I met Jeremy, he goes, uh, you like cars? I'm like, yeah, I'm a big car guy. He goes, how'd you like to take your car and just go as fast as you want? I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Where do I sign up? So... <laughs> <laughs> It's funny. And you know what's so funny is that most of our members go, you know, I'm not a racer. I don't want to drive on a racetrack. And they immediately, uh, that's their first response. And, and then I try to reset or recalibrate their thinking, give them a paradigm shift and say, listen, do you like going around country roads? Yes. Do you feel safe doing that? No. You know, I'm worried about a car around the corner or a dog or a child or whatever else have you. I said, imagine that, but without the police, the dog, the kids, and all those various things. And you can go as fast or as slow as you want to in an environment where everybody's watching you to be able to try to keep you as safe as possible and keep you reined in. And we really coach you and, and prepare you to be used to driving out there. So when I start to talk uh, about the country road and it being a private country road and things like that, the light bulb goes off for these people. Yeah, I, I can see that. You know, Give us some insights. You've, you've raced, you, you know how to, to drive fast, you know the techniques involved. Tell me what techniques, tools, strategies, psychology top racers utilize to be at the peak of their game. Well, I'll tell you what, intermediate beginners, because I can speak to that. But, uh, <laughs> you know, it is being calm and collected and being consistent and not overdriving the car. So let me break that down into a, a little more 
exacting descriptions. So in a race car or in a street car on a racetrack, you want to come into a braking zone and you want to stomp on the brake pedal compared to a car where you ease onto the brake pedal. So you stomp onto the brake pedal, the car settles, then you release or modulate the pedal. The car dances a little bit. So you have to be comfortable and calm with the car feeling a bit out of control. And then you have to be comfortable and calm with going into a corner at 130, 140, 120 miles an hour and going down to 45 miles an hour in a matter of 500 feet. And that is one of the things is getting used to that type environment, getting used to what the car can do and what you can do and being comfortable. The other thing is smooth is fast. So you want to be consistently smooth with the steering wheel, moving and looking to your next point of where you want to be on the racetrack. And you want to drive as if you have a glass of wine on the dash and you do not want that glass of wine to splash around and you do not want to make your smoking hot girlfriend or wife or or your husband or whomever sick in the right seat. So it's hard on the brakes, smooth through the corners, rolling on the gas so you're not overcooking the tires, and then accelerating right into the, to the next corner and then, and then repeating that process. And another analogy that uh, we like to use is pretend you have sponges on your feet full of water and you have sponges uh, on your hands. You never want to squeeze the water out of those sponges so everything should be light and smooth you shouldn't really on the brake when you're hard on the brake it shouldn't be i use the term stomp that's too abrupt but it should be aggressive on the brake and then when you lift off of the gas pedal or put on the brake it should always be fluid and smooth more like a dance than anything else thinking through what's the next corner and then if you make a mistake in the previous corner, quickly forgiving yourself. Because if you don't, that can compound and domino very quickly in your psyche of, you know, having lost in the last few corners. And then you continue that downward spiral. And it's very similar to business. If you've got to build on the successes and you've got to forget and learn from the mistakes. And then once you've done that, you continue to spiral upward or spiral downward and you stay at a level playing field. And I'm of the opinion the day you stop learning is a day you start to become obsolete and you can learn from the brand new employee who walks in that door all the way to the old guy that's been here forever because they're always looking at things in different ways than you are yes and and so i i just really enjoy that from a perspective it's very similar to business that's awesome and i truly believe that you can learn a lot from people that are not executing at all. The ones that are getting really bad results. Teach me what not to do. You know, I love what you just said. Be smooth, be calm, see where you're going, forgive yourself. I mean, those are all great analogies that you can use in any part of your life. When you find yourself in a situation in a car that's out of control, how do you get it back under control? Hmm. You stick your head between your legs and you kiss your ass goodbye. (laughs) (laughs) You know, it... If a car... Well, one of the things that I've heard is, and I don't know if this is true, is that when you're driving, you don't look at the wall. If you look at the wall, that's where you're going to... If you're in a spinning, look at the wall, you're going to end up in the wall. Yeah, wherever you look, you go. And that's a fact. That's deer in the headlights. That's the same psychology as they look at you and they just stand there and they run right at you and you, you run them over. You always want to look at where you want to go, not where you're going. The biggest thing is, is if the car is a bit out of control, it's stay calm. It's don't snap off of the gas or the brakes or do anything abrupt or abrupt steering inputs unless it really requires both feet in, which is brakes and clutch in and or, you know, just brakes in some of these newer technology cars with the paddle shifts. But it's really goes back to everything else in life. It's be calm, be collected fall back on your subconscious resources of how to deal with this situation and let your body react in a calm fashion. And you know, one of the things I remember from my instructor was he always wanted me to pick out the next target that I was shooting for that was down the track, whether that was a hundred yards, don't look right in front of you, figure out where you're going. Yeah. You know, it's that look ahead philosophy. It's keep your eyes up, look where you're going, look at that next point, that next turn in point, that next breaking point, because What you tend to do, God, this is so funny. It's so business metaphorish for a made up word for this, this uh, interview. If you want to look at and look where you want to be, not where you are, because if you're looking at where you are, it's already past you and it's already gone. There's nothing you can do about it. So look right in front of the car. It's too late. Look ahead of where you want to be and where you want to go. You're going to direct the car. 
in those ways and you're going to react and have enough time to react properly for that next turn or breaking zone. Sure. And it works in relationships also. If you want an amazing relationship, figure out what you want to do as a couple to get to that point. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You that's know, that's I need some coaching on that one. Oh, no, 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 no. You, you are yeah. an, you're an amazing father, an amazing husband. I, I know that to be true. Well, I love my kids. They're uh, they're a heck of a lot of fun. I, I love following you on Facebook and seeing uh, some of those pictures. You are a good man, sir. Well, thank you. Tell me a little bit about growing up and some of the mentors that you've had along the way, how they helped you get to where you are now. I did more reading and self inventory than anything. You know, I just really would consistently go through uh, a lot of, you know, where am I weak? Where am I strong? What can I work on? And I would do that inventory about every six months or a year. I listened to pretty much every tape you can think of book from, you know, your, your standard self-help to business books to, you know, the Bible and things that matter to me. And that's really where I grew. And then I, I grew more from interviewing people, from calling and asking a lot of questions. I want to be the dumbest guy in the room and really learn from others. So when an example with this track, this circuit that we have, I called all the racetrack CEOs and owners and people that were running and operating this. And I said, what works? What doesn't? Where'd you make mistakes? Blank sheet of paper. What would you change? Organizational structure, tax structure. What business pricing models worked and what didn't? Where did you advertise and what'd you do? I didn't, I can't point to any real good mentor other than my best friend, uh, Jason Witzke, who is really kind of a life coach to me, almost as, as a really good friend and, and I to he, but it was more of me seeking the answers and standing on the shoulders of the giants who have been there than uh, really in a mentoring relationship. Now, I was in the 1% club with Tommy Newberry, which was a big impact and, and a great resource, and I've read his books. And then I also was in uh, some various Bible studies and churches. I've learned from those. And then I was in another group called C12, which is Christian CEOs. And there was a guy named Bo Fields that was in there, I think, almost four years. And he was a great mentor in my life, too, as I think this question through. Awesome. Some of the most powerful words in the English language are the ones that follow I am. If I asked you, I am, how would you fill out the rest of that statement? I don't like that question. (laughs) (laughs) You know, uh, I am very grateful and humbled to be sitting in the seat of this building and to have such an amazing team. Wow. Yeah, that's it. Well, I'm sure they're pleased to have such an amazing leader as well. Well, they call me crazy, but that's all right. Well, then you know you're doing your job. (laughs) What's your morning routine? You know, my morning routine is is I... I like to listen to a lot of books on tape. I I like to listen to some Christian music. Uh, I read the Bible, drink coffee, and then uh, work out. And so fitness is important. Mental and emotional fitness, for lack of a better description, are important. And just kind of having some quiet time and being introspective and then getting to work and, and pushing hard. I've got, I would say, a very good work-life balance. I probably work 45 hours a week, and uh, I want to be fresh. Now, my mind's always on and always about the business, and I answer emails from sunup to sundown, but I only log about that much time in the office because I think anything past that is worthless for me and for my team because I don't want them to log more hours uh, or they're either underqualified or I'm working them too hard and don't have enough uh, staff, so... That's, that's kind of the routine. Okay. If you had the chance to interview anyone, dead or alive, who would it be? Wow. Hmm. That's a really interesting question. Um, I've got a lot of respect, uh, an unusual respect for Malcolm Gladwell, who, who's written quite a few different books, Tipping Point, Blank, and all these different things. The guy fascinates me. His mind fascinates me, and I enjoy um, – you know, reading his books. I can't put the books down. He'd be an interesting guy to interview and meet with. You know, that that was one that pops up, but that probably wouldn't be the top one. I'd have to think about that answer a bit. That's a good answer. Tell me about a time where you needed to make a business decision or personal decision, and you knew no matter which way you went, it wasn't going to be a perfect solution. Somebody was going to get hurt along the way. How'd you come to the conclusion of how, which way to go? You know, in this business, in the racetrack world, it's not cliquish, it's more cultish. And there are people that will bleed 
for being part of a, a racetrack and and really want to be part and put their heart and soul in it. And there was an amazing person that I really loved and respected that I had hired here. And it was clear that this person was not qualified and couldn't do the role. And this person was pretty beloved by my members and by a lot of different people around here. But the track was suffering, the business was suffering, and it wasn't moving forward as quickly as I could uh, or I thought it could be. And I had to end up letting that person go to be able to move the business forward. And it was a big punch in the gut for the initial three months because, of course, the, the recoil with the members and some of that political side of things. But after that, the lift and the the positive direction the club went in was well worth it. Uh, but it still is, is a little painful that I had to do that to somebody I, I cared for. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I just literally recorded an episode yesterday called Rowers, Passengers, and Anchors. And in any organization, <laughs> you've got these different players. And unfortunately, there's some great people, but they're just dragging the organization down and in order to help everyone you just have to cut that tie with them and it's not easy yeah that's that's uh an interesting descriptor of employees and and it's very hard because you become attached to these people and they become you know somewhat friends and you know their family and everything else and there are some people that have to go and it's very tough to make those decisions yeah no 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 question that concludes part one of our interview with jeremy porter keep an eye out for part two later this week Question of the day. What you've done so far has gotten you to this point. To get to the next level, you're going to have to do something different, something better. Schedule time in your calendar and figure out where your strategies need to be tweaked. Thank you so much for listening today. If you haven't already done so, please go to iTunes, subscribe to the show, download all the episodes, and after listening to the episodes, please leave us a five-star rating and review. Hopefully you found this episode to be helpful. Please share it with others, friends, family, co-workers, or anyone that could utilize this information. You can follow us at Thor Conklin on Twitter and Facebook. The website is thorconklin.com. While at the website, please sign up for our weekly newsletter. If you have any questions, please send them to info at thorconklin.com. And don't forget, We also answer your questions on Sunday. So simply send in your questions. You can do it on Facebook or at the email address. Remember, these episodes are anywhere between 6 and 30 minutes. They are to be consumed during dot time, doing other things, driving, commuting, walking, working out. Not on the racetrack, however. Decide to be a peak performer in all that you do. And until tomorrow, have an absolutely amazing day. 